welcome everybody to this meeting which is hosted by RS21 Scotland. Uh, the meeting's about uh, Afghanistan, the end of the occupation. My name's Nick Cimini. I'm a lecturer at Edinburgh Napier University and a member of RS21 Scotland. And tonight, we're very lucky to be joined by Jonathan Neal and Nancy Lindisfarne. Apologies for my pronunciation if I've uh, mispronounced that. Um, Jonathan and Nancy are two prominent activists and authors who have published widely in places like The Ecologist and Jacobin and RS21 um, and elsewhere. Um, I would particularly recommend Jonathan's book, which is available on the Ecologist website, uh, titled Fight the Fire. Um, I believe that's available as a free download. Um, so that's about climate change and, and green jobs and, and uh, very important issues like that. So if you've not read it yet, then I would recommend that. Maybe somebody might be able to post it in the chat. Um, both Nancy and Jonathan uh, have conducted field work in Afghanistan. Um, they have published widely about the country and they're gonna speak to us tonight for approximately 30 minutes. Um, and there'll be an opportunity for discussion, contributions, debate, and so on afterwards. And we're aiming to finish at 8.30, quite sharp. Um, I think that's a sensible decision. We don't want to keep everyone online for too long. Uh, but before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. I see that Many of you are on mute already, so maybe this uh, warning about staying on mute is a mute point. Oh, somebody save me from this. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if you would like to speak, then feel free to unmute yourself. Um, but if you're not speaking, then please do keep yourself muted because it can interrupt the meeting for, for other people. Um, so I think... I will give Nancy and uh, Jonathan a warning at roughly 10 minutes to go, if, if that's okay. And maybe again, if necessary, another one when you're approaching five. Yeah, brilliant, Nancy, thank you. Um, and we'll, as I say, we'll have plenty of time for questions, comments and discussion afterwards. Uh, so thanks very much, Nancy and Jonathan. Hello, everybody. Um, really nice to be here. Nice to see a number of old friends and some I hope will become new ones. Um, we want to, I suppose, be very blunt in what we're trying to say here because there's so much misinformation about Afghanistan and there has been over the nearly 50 years of war and so forth. So. One is trying to talk against that and make some sense of what we're seeing now. And in that respect, um, the first thing to say is quite simply, um, the Taliban defeated the United States. Um, simply, it's a defeat. It's a military defeat in the respect, uh, in respect of the fact that people who started out in sandals have actually sort of won a war against the greatest military power on earth. And it's also a political defeat because the Taliban are presently setting up a government in Kabul. What the future of that government is, who knows, but they have done this and they have actually done this, we'll come back to that, without any bloodshed in this last moments of the, of the rout of the United States. And this is hard for an awful lot of people to even imagine how it happens. And part of that is because they don't think of this or don't understand that the Taliban have actually won because they had a great deal of popular support. And they don't think of it as a military, as a guerrilla war. This is, it hasn't been portrayed like that. It's been a bunch of mad fanatics sort of running around the country that is, is you know, really beyond the pale anyway, rather than understanding that no guerrilla war ever has ever been won with this kind of disproportionate power without the support of local people. And that means people in villages, that means people in towns, that means also 
a substantial portion of an urban population. And this simply gets lost sight of in understanding what has happened. Um, in a sense, the Taliban aren't by left or right allowed to be decent guerrilla fighters fighting tactically and strategically to win against all the odds in the world. And the third thing to say before I hand over to Jonathan, who's going to say a bit more about the Taliban is this is not because the people of Afghanistan are particularly in love with the Taliban, that they gave them their support, but that over the long haul of these 20 years, the American occupation has been unbelievably cruel, unbelievably corrupt, and absolutely without any regard whatsoever for ordinary Afghan people. Um, Certainly, they have favored their own cronies that have been associated, their co-conspirators in the occupation. But beyond that, their, their carelessness with Afghan lives has been extraordinary. And so ordinary people have understood that, in fact, the Taliban are, first of all, have not been corrupt. Whether this will remain the case, we don't know. But they haven't been corrupt. They've been decent and concerned to gain this local support by warning people that you know, there's liable to be fighting nearby, by protecting people ahead of time and so forth and so on. And that has actually won them a favor. It's not because people love their religious beliefs or anything else, but simply that they have been more decent in a very, very inhumane war. And, um, with this respect, in this respect, I suppose um, the thing to mention is that there is an absolutely superb article in the New Yorker from, I think, September the 12th, um, which is by Anan Gopal, who's a very, very impressive journalist who has been in Afghanistan for the last seven or eight months. He's written a very good book, but he's also written this article, which is called The, the Other Afghan Woman. And what he's actually saying, because he went and interviewed grandmothers and interviewed people in Sangin, in the Sangin Valley of the Helman district, which is one of the areas where the, the Brits have, have fought in Musagala and Nozad and so forth, and interviewed these ordinary women um, and found out that they just told tale after tale of the last 40 years of war. And the fact that they also had many, many reservations about the Taliban, but at the end of the day, they were the ones that they would actually support. They were relieved to be having the Taliban in power. And this is very, very telling because the, the amount of violence in those particular areas has just been extraordinary. Um, and this is part of the double act. Da -dum. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do now, who, who are the Taliban? What sort of people are they? First thing to say is they've changed mm. over the last 20 years since 2001. When they first came, but when they first came into power in 1995, it's very important to understand they were something new in politics, something new in global politics, actually, because they were a product. They're not a product of feudal society. They're a product of the late 20th century. Uh, and if uh, two very important late 20th century institutions. One is the refugee camp. Their great body of their soldiers were young Pashtun men and boys who had been raised in refugee camps during the uh, Russian occupation of Afghanistan and during the civil civil war that followed. They were very poor boys in the in the camps who could not afford to go to a normal Pakistani primary school. Um, and instead went to the local schools in the camps run by the mullahs, um, which and the name for those kind of students is Taliban. The leadership of the Taliban also were something new. They, we tend to talk of them as if they as if they were people like the Islamist political parties that had come before them in Afghanistan or like Al Qaeda or like ISIS or like um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or Erdogan's people in Turkey. And in class terms, they're not. 
all of those movements were led by educated people. Um, people with usually university educations were the leaders. Um, the Taliban were different in that they were led by village mullahs. Uh, and village mullahs in Afghanistan are people of very low status, relative. I mean, they're, they have more status than a sharecropper, <laughs> but they, and they are able to read. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, but um, they're poor. They're poor. They're poor men. So this was for the first time a movement of poor people and refugees led by poor men. They were also a product of modern aerial bombardment. Um, the uh, the original leading twelve man committee, the Shura of the Taliban. Every single one of those 12 people had lost an eye, a hand, or a foot um, in bombing mm. or from mines, all 12 of the leaders. This, again, is quite different from any other um, uh, Islamist movement. These people were the rank and file. And they were people, um, but they had a very, imp they had two very important weaknesses. One was that they were. Uh, that they were Pashtun chauvinists. Mm. And the Pashtuns are about half the population of Afghanistan, and they were racist towards the other groups in Afghanistan, mm. which made it very, very difficult for them to hold on. And also, they had really quite a right wing religious um, and gender politics, which most Afghans did not support. Which came from the Saudis. Which came from the Saudis. Mm. And what this meant was that in 2001, when the Americans invaded, people in Afghanistan at that point were desperate for peace. They had had, with the Russian invasion, the civil war, they'd had 22 years, 23, 22 years of civil war by that point. They were desperate for peace. And no one fought for the Taliban. Mm. No Afghans also fought for the, the Northern Alliance, which is allied with the Americans, Afghans simply refused to fight when the mm. Americans invaded. Mm. So a deal was made that the Afghan, um, a deal, the Pakistani military intelligence brokered a deal whereby the Taliban could go home and go back to the villages and would not be persecuted or go into exile in Pakistan, whichever they chose, and that the uh, Americans would get to take Kabul. And that's how the Americans came into power. And the the Taliban went home. And the Taliban went home. And the majority of Afghans, even in the heartland of the Taliban around Kandahar and Helmand, mm. there was this very important. There was no resistance to the mm. Americans for the first two years. None. No armed resistance. That is by such contrast to what happened in Iraq. In Iraq with Saddam when the Americans invaded Iraq, but what happened in Afghanistan when the Russians invaded mm. both places. But Af Afghans were hoping for peace and they were hoping, they were assuming that they would have economic development yep. and that this would be good for poor people because the United States was so rich, it would, of course, the Americans would help them to get out of poverty mm. it, um, they, and they would have peace. And they were wrong about both these things. Mm. Am I going on too much? No, not at all. I just wanted, I mean, <laughs> because... Because it's also important, um, it's worth saying in Afghanistan at this point, because it's a very arid and desperate country, is that they were actually, when the Americans came in, in the middle of an eight-year drought in the poorest country and one of the driest countries in the world. So there was a vulnerability which was extraordinary, yes. and people were hopeful that the Americans would actually alleviate this desperate, desperate situation. But I thought you ought to kind of jump because the, the new Taliban are actually different. Yep. And then the Taliban changed over the last 20 years in the process of building a mass guerrilla movement. They changed. Uh, and the key change was that they welcomed absolutely steadily tried to welcome all of the other ethnic groups in mm. Afghanistan into their alliance. Mm. Um, with one ethnic group, which is the poorest, the people who live in the central mountains, uh, the, the Hazaras, um, they failed. Mm. But, no, no, they won. 
sorry, they only, sorry, they, they succeeded. They didn't bring over the, the hazards. No, no, but your sentence began the other way oh, around. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I, <laughs> um, that, um, <laughs> um, they, um, but with they brought over the other ethnic groups, and this meant that when you saw all of this, all of the provincial capitals and all of the towns and cities fall to the Taliban over the course of nine days, this was not an army sweeping across the country. Hmm. This was the local people in the villages, which surrounded the cities moving into the cities hmm. so it was the the rank and file and very importantly they did it because they had expected peace they did not get peace the americans continued the war very hmm. important the americans tortured an enormous number of people yeah. um and people didn't necessarily support the taliban but they thought <laughs> their choice was in a war their choice was to support the american occupation the government in kabul allied with the americans the old warlords of the Mujahideen who everybody hated or the Taliban. In that situation, mm. people chose the Taliban. Um, and, um, and they were, but it was still, this was still a movement largely of poor people, yeah. sharecroppers and small peasants, mm. a largely rural movement. And very importantly, everybody said the judges the Taliban had their own system of judges and their judges were honest. And what that meant, above all else, was that in land disputes, the Taliban judges would rule for the small, the unimportant, the weak, the poor people, if the poor people had a better case. And no Afghan court before had ever done this. So there's a strong class element to what they're doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, Am I supposed to talk about American public opinion or are you? Um, I just wanted to add two things, I suppose. Yes. One is, um, we should have said earlier, I suppose, about 80% of the population of Afghanistan is rural. So when Jonathan is actually talking about this class bias and and what it meant to recruit Uzbeks or IMAX or members of other ethnic groups in the north, we're talking about a very, very rural country and, of course, enormously poor. But at the same time, as you describe them as part of a rank and file, these people are not savages. They're not barbarians. Since 2014, they've been actually negotiating with the um, Americans in Doha. They've been using the internet. They've become incredibly able to coordinate actions and all the rest of it. And they're perfectly sophisticated in terms of the kind of tactics that were available to them and so forth. So that that image of the, the the wild savage you know stupid what feudal peasants stuff just doesn't wash either so it's a it's a complicated picture that we've been fed yeah do you want to talk about the americans yeah the other thing that's happened over the last 20 years that is very important is that american public opinion has shifted against the war in afghanistan and it's but it's shifted in a a, a bit of a surprising way the people, uh, the right wing, the supporters of Trump and the supporters of the grassroots of the Republican Party are against the war in Afghanistan. Mm. They're strongly against the war in Afghanistan because they're closely connected to many of the people who have had to go and fight mm. in Afghanistan. The soldiers, but also crucially the families of the mm. American soldiers mm. who went for five, six, seven, eight tours and we're not likely to die, but we're very likely to, to be maimed. maimed for life, to have their legs blown off um, by roadside bombs. So those people, the grassroots Republican Party, um, very strongly opposed to uh, the war and the people to the the left, the kind of ordinary Hispanic and African-American and, and sort of white union people also, everybody, not that they supported the Taliban, but they thought those wars have to end. Mm. Not only that, but that the American population, I think with this defeat is against any more Mm. any more foreign wars in the Middle East or any more wars anywhere else. This is sometimes hard to grasp but because the overwhelming majority of the public opinion that we hear from the New York Times or the television or whatever, um, is the mainstream, what's called the mainstream, which is quite small relatively, 
<laughs> um, uh, is uh, strongly in favor of the war. Barack Obama was absolutely crucial. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton brought the educated, uh, cool, liberal people over to support war. Well, and a surge in Afghanistan. And the surge in Afghanistan. Nearly 100,000 soldiers, which didn't work. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, that's, uh, but that's, in the long run, that's enormously important. It's important for two reasons, one of which is that the majority of American people have decided that the American empire is not in their interests. Mm. It does not benefit them. They've decided this on many different levels. Mm. Um, but there is still around Biden and so on there, there, and the generals and so on, uh, every the, the American ruling class still wants to have an empire. Mm. But the people no longer want to have it. I, I think that's the case. I think um, to see you've got 10 minutes, 10 okay. minutes. OK. Um, two things, I suppose, uh, maybe to just follow this up and say a little bit of we certainly think this is liable to be a turning point in world history, that you have this great military power that has been defeated by people in a small, desperately poor country. and. This weakens the American empire in the eyes of everyone around the world. Um, we know from Vietnam that, in fact, the United States never actually had any other kind of major military venture for 15 years. They were completely stymied. If you were in trouble as a dictator, as, as somebody who wanted America as your ally, um, after this, you're not so sure. You'd go and look for somebody else. And at this point, we have possibly a, well, I would think a declining empire for various other reasons as well, but you have China on the ascendant. And this is very interesting, partly because the styles are different. Um, and there is within Afghanistan a, we will talk maybe more about the future after we've heard some of your questions and stuff, but there is a real impetus on the part of the Chinese, but also the other regional powers. So Iran, Pakistan, Russia, Central Asian republics to see peace in Afghanistan. And because the chaos of this boiling turmoil spreads out, it means possibly refugees of huge numbers in Iran or um, Pakistan. It means possible Islamist sort of upsurges in Central Central Asia and so forth. And it's an opportunity for the Chinese to prop up the Taliban in um, their Belt and Road project. And so the Afghan state is in a is perversely, I suppose, the one of the possibilities of the survival of the um, Taliban government is literally in the interests of these other powers that are very much opposed to the United States for various complicated reasons. So you get a strange new dynamic going on that's being played out again against this poor little political football. Um, I'm looking at time and I suppose there's a big topic that we haven't talked about, which is probably in people's minds and you can do it. Nancy says she's really tired. She's been talking about women in the veil in Afghanistan for 40 years, and now she's making me do it. <laughs> um, um, but we're agreed on the argument. The, the gender politics, the sexual politics of the Taliban, we have to face head on, and they are sexist. They're sexist. Um, they're sexist. And this is an enormous tragedy. And it's part of a larger tragedy for both feminists and the left, mm. a tragedy with a history. Um, when I lived in Afghanistan, the people in the early 1970s, the people I admired most were the communists. And they, um, they came to power in a military coup in 78. And as soon as they came to power, they, uh, they launched two policies. One was to share out the land, to take the land away from the big landowners who owned whole villages and give it to the sharecroppers. And the other one was a whole series of uh, policies about the rights of women. Mm 
So they were feminists and they were socialists. Mm -hmm. And but it was a military coup. They had not won the support of the majority of the population. And the only way that that communist government could stay in power was for the Soviet Union, uh, the Russians to invade. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the the Soviet invasion um, killed a million people. Mm -hmm maimed a million people, drove six million people into exile in, um, in other countries, four million internal um, ex uh, exiles, this in a population then of 25 million. Um, an enormous killing, an enormous cruelty, which the communists supported. They, cluster bombs. Uh, cluster bombs. The <laughs> communists felt they had no uh, no alternative but to support it. Um, and that meant that by the time the rising of the Afghan people had driven out the Soviet uh, soldiers, um, there was no support, almost no support for five, five, three minutes, almost almost no support for feminism. Five minutes, sorry. Five, almost no support for feminism in Afghanistan in the way in the same way as if in Britain, um, uh, Britain had been, feminists had called for the invasion of Britain and the invading country that took over and was a dictatorship in Britain had killed two and a half million British people and maimed two and a half million British people and sent 20 million British people into exile and refugee camps. There would be little support for the feminists who would call for that. Um, this was a catastrophic tragedy. Mm. And, and it's then been, it's been repeated. It's been repeated. <laughs> it's been repeated. The and the uh, and the American invasion, um, a new generation of feminists who really did want most of them, some chancers, some corrupt, but mostly really did want women's rights and women's equality in Afghanistan. They sided with the Americans and could only work in areas where the American military would protect. Them. So they're co-opted. They're co-opted. And, and, they, and in both cases, very important, sided with the torturers. Yeah. And the people who are tortured are just people who are picked up off the street. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Are picked up off villages. Mm -hmm. So that's left us with a situation where, again, um, feminism is deeply discredited. It doesn't mean that Afghan women don't want equality. <laughs> Of course they do. <laughs> of yeah. course they do. And it um, but it means that politically uh, ideologically it's 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 just not a, a goer. And the, we're also yeah. forgetting the fact that because of the utter illegitimacy of the American invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11. Very, very soon after that, in November, you have both Laura Bush and Jerry Blair, if you remember, justifying this military onslaught in terms of saving Afghan women. So you get from the very beginning this kind of rhetoric about women because you can't say, well, gee, we're we're invading you know, a country which really doesn't deserve this kind of treatment. Sorry about 9-11, but you know, this is inappropriate. But Last gasp, because I know you're, Nick, you're waving your hands and stuff. Um, I think it's important also to understand, yes, the Taliban are for sure sexist, but they're not a whole bunch more sexist than a sexist you know at home, right? I mean, you know, the sexists you know, they're that kind of sexist. <laughs> and there are plenty of them, and we all have met them. And by the same token, the Afghan women are absolutely no more passive than your daughter or your mother or your sister. They're not passive people. These are part of how we've been told to understand these people and it's and how we should help them. And that is just utterly wrong. Let me talk. Yep. 